In this video, we want to explore the relationship between Newton's law of gravity as a force in terms of the concepts that we learned in chapter 5, I'm sorry, in chapter 7, which was potential energy. Now, let us remind ourselves of a couple of things from this chapter. Back in chapter 7, we learned a lot about energy and work and their relationship to one another. When we want to relate work to force, we knew that work was the integral of a force acting over a distance from position one to position two. Okay, from this we derive what was called the work energy theorem, which said that work was equal to the change in kinetic energy, and work was also equal to the negative change in potential energy, depending on how we defined uh, the orientation of the system would dictate the negative sign. From this we said that if we had, then, if delta k is equal to a negative delta u, another way of rearranging that is saying that delta k plus delta u is equal to zero. And if we define total energy as k plus u, then for most systems, delta e is equal to zero. And this is what we called conservation of energy. We want to see in this chapter how this applies to gravity, and if we can relate what we determine for the potential gravitational energy in a system uh, in Newton's law of gravitation uh, to something that we're already familiar with, namely good old what we called gravitational potential energy back in chapter 7 was just mg delta y. Can we relate that to what we're going to find in this chapter? And of course, since Newton had all the answers, the answer is going to be yes. So let's see how all this fits into this puzzle. Using what we just talked about, and starting from the fact that Newton's law of gravitation looks like this, let us then define what the gravitational potential energy is. Work then would be the integral of the force, I mean the work due to gravitation here would be the force of gravitation integrated over some distance as we move some, from some point one to some point two. So let's take a system where we have two different radii. Let's draw this a little bit clearer. We'll have an R2 and an R1, where the force is a circular force, like we've been working with in this chapter, which is caused by gravity. In this case, then, we know that the force of gravity would always be pointing towards the center of the circle, and so we'll give this the directionality of down, which we know according to our rules from chapter one, and our vector laws gives a negative sign. Now, we know that the force of gravitation is a radial force. It's in the radial direction, which means that the force of gravity dotted into a piece of distance, the displacement will be radial, which means that this will just be f of g times dr, as long as f of g is a function of r, which we know that it is. And I remind you of our lesson on dot products and how they relate to integration from chapter 7. So using this and the fact that we just agreed that the direction would be down, we get a negative integral from point 1 to point 2, of being Newton's gravitational force integrated over R, which is going to be the negative integral of capital G M1 M2 over R squared dr. Now, unless some sort of cataclysmic event happens, the mass of object 1 and the mass of object 2 don't change. We know capital G is Newton's universal constant. So all of those come outside of the integral, and we're left with the integral of dr over r squared, where again, we're doing this from radius one to radius two. Now, I remind you of our laws of integration, which says that the integral of x to the n dx is equal to one over, uh, I apologize, equal to one over n plus one, x to the n plus one power, Obviously, with a plus c, if it was not a definite integral, but in this case it is. So for the integral above, we identify that n 
is going to be negative 2, which means that n plus 1 is going to be negative 1. So, plugging those in to the integral, we see that the work done by gravity is going to be negative g m1 m2 and we evaluate the integral to give us a negative 1 times 1 over r evaluated at the limits from r1 to r2. The negative signs cancel and so this gives us a negative g m1 m2 over r evaluated from 1 to 2. And let's stop there for a moment to analyze this. Namely, we're saying that if we want the work to move from one orbit to the next or from one point uh, in radii to the next point, then it would be given by this equation. Another way of saying that we now know is the potential energy is just going to be your g m1 m2 over r. That is the potential energy due to gravity at any one given point. But let's return to the equation that we just had above and let's have a little bit of fun with it. Because right now, this answer should not shock you because you know you can always do a gut check which says that we can always go the other way around and know that force is the negative derivative of the potential energy with respect to distance. And if we do this negative derivative, it's going to give us back exactly what we had, which is g m1 m2 over r squared, which should make sense to you because we know that derivatives and integrations are just inverse uh, mathematical operations of one another. But let's go back to this formula for work and see if we can have a little bit of fun with it. Namely, let's plug in the actual limits here. Well, if we do that then, the work done by gravity is a g m1 m2 1 over, and if we apply the fundamental theorem of calculus, I'm sorry, back here I made a mistake and I did not cancel out that negative sign as I should have, r2 minus r1. That's the work required to move from 2 to 1, since we define this going in the downward direction. But let's just have some fun with algebra for a second. Let's multiply the first fraction here, number 1, by an r1 over r1, namely the number 1. And let's multiply the second fraction by an r2 over r2, namely another version of the number 1. Upon doing this, we see that the work done by gravity is g m1 m2 r1 over r1 r2 minus 1 over r2 r1 r2. And we have an alternate form for this now, which says that g m1 m2 over r1 r2 times r1 minus r2. Now, why did I go through this algebra when we already basically had what we wanted? Well, it's just to convince us of something that we're already familiar with. Namely, that let's assume that what we're talking about here, that the object producing the gravity, is the Earth itself. Then we know that m1 would be the Earth, or the mass of the Earth. Further, we know that if we're really close to the surface of the Earth, then r1 times r2 could just be the radius of the Earth squared. And we convinced ourselves of that in a previous lecture. Namely, that the gravity, uh, the, the gravitational force uh, doesn't change much whether you're at sea level or you're all the way at the top of Mount Everest. Which means then that the work done by gravity at close to the Earth is really g times the mass of the Earth. And we can factor out the 1 over r1, r2 common denominator, and call it radius of Earth squared. And that's multiplied by m2, r1 minus r2. And this is very powerful because now we recognize this quantity in parentheses, this gme over re squared. Well, we've seen this in a previous lecture 
that g, mass of the Earth, divided by the radius of the Earth squared, is also known as little g, which is 9.81 meters per second squared. Which means that the work done by gravity close to the Earth is nothing more than g, m2, r1 minus r2, and we know that r1 minus r2 is just a delta r. But as we drew the system, it's really a change in height. Therefore, we have come to the conclusion that the work done by gravity close to the Earth is the mass of the object in question times g times delta y. And to be clear, okay, to be clear here, we technically said that we were going from 2 to 1 or from point 0.2 to point 0.1. So this is really a negative sign because we know that r1 minus r2 is the same as negative of r2 minus r1, which then is the same as a negative change in height. So if that's the case and we apply the work energy theorem, then the work done by gravity is a negative change in potential energy. Therefore, the negative change in potential energy is negative m2g delta y, and we get back to our familiar mg delta y. And this is of the utmost importance because it convinces us that although Newton's law of gravity, which dictates on a point-by-point -point potential as a function of r, something which looks quite different than what we called gravitational potential energy back in chapter 7, if we are evaluating it close to the Earth, as all of our projectile motion and other types of problems dealt with, then these two statements are basically equivalent. Now that we have this idea of gravitational potential energy under our belt, that means that we now have the ability to apply things like conservation of energy to it, and that's what we will do in the next video. Until then, never stop thinking.